Welcome to Stories from the Center of the Universe, the podcast about the human experience. Robin Dreek, welcome to the Center of the Universe. <laughs> Paul, that is a wonderful entrance. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> I, I've been using it for a while now. I, I did it one time. And my buddy said, never do anything else ever again. Always use that uh, opening. That is fantastic, especially when, you know, my my first book I wrote, it's it's called It's Not All About Me. And you just literally said it is all about me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think what I'm saying, one of the things I'm saying is I'm from a little town called Ashland and we consider ourselves the center of the universe. It's mostly tongue in cheek. Uh, the other meaning and, and the, the primary meaning for me is it's just two people talking and we, we've become the center of each other's universe. And you are the center uh, of the universe for this particular recording. Awesome. Being ultimately present. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I guess we should start with you and I were connected over email by Pete A. Turner. Yep. That was, that is our connection, no doubt. And do you and Pete know each other from podcasting or was it before that? Yes. A number of years ago, he reached out to me first to be on his show because of my first book or one of one of my books that came out and he stumbled across it. Or we introduce introduce each other through someone else just because we work in that counterintelligence intelligence circle thing. So I, I can't remember exactly the impetus. It was probably my book, The Code of Trust, is what I'm guessing. Um, yeah, it's about probably three or four years, maybe. But when I when I asked Pete uh, to share a couple of folks, uh, you were one of his first two, and, and Pete's talked to fifteen hundred folks, I think. Oh yeah, yeah. He's he's a serial talker, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, awesome. All right, well, can we start with uh, where you grew up and what growing up was like for you? Yeah, sure. I grew up in a smallish kind of town, about an hour, hour and a half north of New York City, called Carmel, New York. Actually, in the suburbs of even Carmel, a place called Kent Cliffs, and it was a small place on a lake i lived about i I literally was one of those guys that walked uh, just about a mile to the bus stop uphill half of the way (laughs) and there was about a 40 45 minute bus ride to school in the morning and it was my it was in the middle of nowhere it was definitely in the sticks i lived on a small lake big pond and surrounded by trees woods and lots of hills, lots of rocks. I spent a lot of time outside because I, our house, my parents have never owned a home. Um, both my parents did not have a college education. My dad was drafted in the Marine Corps during Vietnam, married my mother when he was 23. My mom was 21-ish, going on 22. Uh, I was born six months later, so we know what the uh, impetus for that was. And so there you go. You know, you grow up in a house with... Not a lot of things. My parents have never owned a home, as I said. And so it was make things work. Yeah. um, And and that probably benefits you in a lot of ways today, uh, self-reliance and independence, that sort of thing. But I'm guessing you you tell me. Yeah, it's something I discovered later on in the sense of that everything I believe in life is a dichotomy, a balance between two things. And until we discover what that dichotomy is, we kind of go extreme in the one side. And so, yeah, for all those years when you were being self-reliant, you know, it's it's a house that had some addiction in it. And when you're dealing with that and being hypersensitive to people's behavior to trying to not get someone on a bad day or a, a bad time of day and you have a low economic extremely low economic status you you have to be self-reliant like you said i remember so my mother my mother's parents used to slip my parents some money on the side because my dad worked in retail uh, at a department store he's a department manager in a department store and my mom worked as a, as like a playground aide at a school and there you go. And when my grandmother died and now my grandparents, my grandfather had a ninth grade education. He grew up on the Hudson River. And when he grew up, one of his jobs during the summer, well, during the winter was cutting blocks of ice out of the Hudson River, packing it in hay so you could have ice in the ice boxes during the summer. And wow. so my grandmother had, uh, she had a high school education, but back then, the the thing to aspire to as a uh, girl graduating 
high school was going to secretarial school. So my grandmother was a secretary at a, at a, uh, whatchamacallit, at a gas station. And oh. so that was my grandparents who were giving my parents money on the side until my grandmother passed away when I was nine. And I remember my mother, I came home from school at the end of the school year. My mother said, we have no money for school clothes this year. And this is when I was going into middle school. The years where if you don't look the right way, the cool kids are going to be merciless on you. And, and they were anyway. I was bullied really well, really fantastic job of being bullied, um, fighting the whole nine yards, learning how to stand up for yourself. But the, the that real impetus there of my mother saying, we have no money for school clothes. And I remember looking at her and saying, I can't remember if I said it out loud, but I definitely said it into myself, I'm done with you. <laughs> I'm going to figure this out because I need a pair of Lee jeans. I need a pair of Nike sneakers and I needed a red Adidas t-shirt with a blue hoodie. That was the outfit I needed to wear to look cool at that age. And it was going to cost me 60 bucks back then to get, I, it's so funny. I remember all these things so vividly. And so I put started putting flyers in neighbors' mailboxes that I would cut lawns. I would be your manual labor guy, and I made a boatload of money um, doing that. I became self reliant doing it. And oh, the 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 other really good thing, I'm sorry, the other forging thing at that age was the parent the house my parents rented. It was a two bedroom with a galley kitchen and one and one bathroom, no insulation, so it was really frigidly cold. Oh. And what was really challenging in New York, you know, because we lived upstate was it got really cold in the winter and, and winters in the seventies, early eighties in New York was, I mean, I remember our Lake was frozen by November every year. Right. Yeah. And one year, our furnace, we had a crawl space and the furnace had fallen off the bottom of the floor onto the ground in the crawl space. And I remember my mother called the landlord who lived in New York city and said, we, you know, the furnace is broken. And she said, I can't afford to buy a new one unless I raise your rent. My parents couldn't afford a rent raise, and so they took our their last four hundred dollars. They bought a wood burning stove, installed the wood burning stove, and we heated our house all by wood for about three years until we moved from that place. I remember our first winter. I'm out there because I was an only child, splitting wood all winter, all night long because we ran out of wood in January, and we had to drop a tree onto the frozen lake. And I'm trudging it across, and uh, I was. And when we woke up in the morning, this is the other funny thing. You woke up in the morning. You had to take a hair dryer to the seam of the door because all the condensation inside the house, because we put we put plastic on the windows to try to hold in the heat, but also made a boatload of moisture inside the house. And so the inside was frozen solid. So you actually had to chisel your way out in the morning. <laughs> I mean, I, I grew up with a wood burning stove and it puts out a lot of heat locally, but it's not going to heat more than one room typically. Yeah, there was ice in my room. When I woke up in the morning, there was ice on the inside of the windows. Did you find some nights where you just had to sleep near the stove? Um, yeah, we would do that. I, I was pretty bundled up though at night. You know, it's it's so funny because when we go through these things, no one ever says, Oh, look, this is horrible. Look at me. And and I never once, and this is also the the telltale sign of those people in life that function highly, highly, and that is I never saw myself as a victim. I didn't see it as trauma. I saw it as this is life. What are you going to do about it? And so you're faced with a challenge and you just work the challenge. One challenge after the other. You know, one of my favorite movies and books of all time is uh, The Martian. I love that book because you just work the problem and eventually you work enough problems and and you're going to live. So it's the same thing here. It's the same thing with successful people in life. Not saying I am, but... I've seen it on my show, as I know you've seen it on yours, people that have curiosity and an ability to solve challenges in life and not be a wound collector, you're going to do very well. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, it is There's nothing more disheartening uh, than seeing somebody you know from childhood or somebody you've worked with uh, or a family member, and they they are professional victims. And I'm like, it's, it's not going to help you get to a better place. You're not going to feel contentment. Uh, you may feel temporary ease, uh, but it's it's just not a way to, to be long term. Um, and it's it speaks to our culture that I think we have more victims today than we've ever had. But uh, my podcast is not about trying to uh, determine where society's going. Absolutely. But yeah, no, that's, that's that's the origin story. That's where it all started. Yeah. So only kid. Uh, very, very humble beginnings. Did you, you have anything that you considered fun growing up? I loved it all. 
I, 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 I loved working. I loved mowing grass. It's funny thing is I didn't have my own lawnmower. We had a, one of those push mowers where the blades rotate. Um, so I had to borrow lawnmowers uh, from the people I was cutting lawns from. And I loved it all. I had a lot of independence because I had to be self-reliant. And my parents, it was a trauma household with alcohol abuse in it. But at the same time, though, it wasn't unloving. It was just dramatic is a good way to put it. And so I was lucky and fortunate in that. And but I I loved every minute of growing up. It was it's really interesting. I mean, there's moments, you know, there's massive embarrassment because you couldn't bring people to your house or because of drinking and and the, and there was absenteeism in life and, and all the major events because people are either working or drinking. Um, but by and large, I, I loved growing up. I had a lot of autonomy. I remember when I hit 16, my parents said, well, you can drive the car. We had, we had two cars kind of working. Um, they said, you can drive the one, but in order to drive the, the one C, C10 pickup truck we had, that's what we had to have to get the wood. Um, I had to pay the car. I, I had to pick up the car insurance for the whole family in order for me to drive the truck. And then I never, I never even had access. I remember it was $760 a year back then for me to pay for the car insurance, which is a ton of money back then. Yeah. Oh yeah. And so, but I was the one making the money. Um, so I had to, but I never even got to drive the thing. And so I wound up buying myself a motorcycle when I was 16. So I could drive, so I could drive back and forth to work. And I remember the funniest things in the world was, I'm going down and this is all winter long in the snow because I used to work, you know, after I grew out of um, doing all the great manual labor around my neighborhood, which I should have stuck with doing because that's where I was making the cash. I was working at restaurants and health clubs and all, you know, I had a million jobs. Remember during the winter, I had a I rode my motorcycle year round and I had to uh, have my feet extended in the snow to keep myself upright from sliding out as my wheels. I'm following the, the tracks of the car in front of me to keep the thing balanced. <laughs> That's good stuff, man. I loved it, though. It, it was is it was a very I had a lifetime of work experience before I even graduated high school. <laughs> as you say, uh, I guess in high school, I I. Ask some guests, hey, were you a jock? Were you more of an academic type, uh, music type? It sounds like you were the, like all you did, you, you did all of it, uh, but you were outside of school. You weren't, you were doing your homework, but it sounds like you were just working. Yeah. And so at a young age, I wanted to go to the Naval Academy and I, I, I did work my ass off to get in there. I did all the school activities. I actually was in band. I was, I was, I was the only, I think I was the only one ever. I was in marching bands. I played trumpet for years. I was in marching band as well as the football team. I was a starter on the football team for my entire time in high school. And it was interesting. I used to do the marching band practice and in my football pads and then run from marching band practice over to the football thing. And it was blowing people's mind because, you know, you got the band geeks and you have the football players. I was everything. The thing that probably saved me was every weekend. So our football games, when I grew up in high school, they were Saturday mornings. Then after the football game, everyone would go to a party. I went to work, so I never got to party anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you sound like you're a really tough kid. Is is a lot of that out of uh, just necessity? You ended up going through yeah. tough times because you had to? Yeah. yeah. So I love figuring out these backstories of people because they tell you a lot of where we're going to be in life if we're going to be satisfied in life because mm -hmm. we're happy. So when I was growing up, the thing my, my parents would dump me at my uh, my grandparents' house every weekend until my grandmother passed away, and so every weekend my grandmother would play with me. I remember vividly, and she would play. My favorite thing I used to play was school. I loved to be the teacher. From age four or five, and there's there's two things in there that that transcribe and, and follow forward in life is teaching and educating others, which is a passion I've always had. I loved it when in the when I was doing it in the Marine Corps, loved it inside the FBI, understanding human behavior is part of that. But the other part too is a is a blend of being an only child, being severely bullied, like fights at the bus stop every single day, and standing up to these things because I craved wanting to be liked. So that became a huge driving factor for decision making and how to stand up to bullies, because if I didn't stand up to bullies, well, I was going to be less liked. So it was really a fascinating dichotomy of the choices I was making. The one thing I I, I was fortunate 
as we all are from time to time, I had a couple mentors and guides. I didn't know I needed one. I didn't know. I didn't feel like I had anyone I was looking up to. No one was giving me advice, but I, I did have people that were inserting themselves by happen chance throughout these formative years that kind of helped me get to that next step. You know, whether it's getting the nail cam because my grades were okay, but I did have to take the SATs seven times <laughs> just get this just to get the bare minimum score to be able to get qualified for the application to the naval academy i sucked at test taking and i finally so i finally get the bottom score and it took me next year to get in the naval academy i did a year of what's called the naval academy foundation and so but all i ever wanted to do in life was be an astronaut mm. and so i get to the naval academy i want to be a navy pilot i want to be a test pilot astronaut all these things right and aerospace engineer is a way to do that. What idiot lets a guy that took the SAT seven times major in aerospace engineering? So I, I majored in aerospace for about a year and a half. That did not go so well. <laughs> so, yeah, good stuff, man. It was it was fantastic. What a ride. <laughs> what, what, what did the astronaut uh, idea come from? Um, I There's a lot of things that go into all these decisions. So... Growing up, you know, I, I'm 54. I'll be 55 this year. Um, at that age, and it, fun was laying out under stars at night and literally looking up at stars. And I was big into astronomy. I remember Carl Sagan was big back then. He wrote the book Contact long before it became a movie. I read that. I thought that was really cool. My dad was into sci-fi, got me into sci-fi stuff. I remember Star Trek was a big part of my life growing up. Uh, at a very young age. Matter of fact, the first memory of my room when I was about three or four years old was the Starship Enterprise above my head and a Klingon battle cruiser on the other thing that, that my dad had made as a model. So I've always been into space. And then we had a, a friend of the family was a pilot for United Airlines, and he had been a pilot during the Vietnam War. And he's a Navy pilot. And he fl actually flew with John McCain and that whole crew off the mm -hmm. Ariskany aircraft carrier. And he flew A4 Skyhawks. And his I Love Me room and his room was the coolest thing I ever saw. And we didn't have money for college. And this guy was a Navy guy. His house is awesome. They're good friends of my parents. I mean, so there's all these things that kind of align as like, that's what I want to do. Then Reagan was a president during the early part of my high school career, you know, during those formative years. And it wasn't about... Democrats, Republicans, I didn't know. It was just about, here's this guy who's like inspiring you to serve your country and doing all these great things and the space shuttle program and that whole thing. So there you go. <laughs> That's a great answer. Uh, just so we're you and I are, are on the same page. I am 54. I will be 55 later this year. I, I was a massive Generation 1 Star Trek fan as a kid. Yep. I don't recognize any other generation of Star Trek. <laughs> it's the original or nothing for me. Um, yeah, but I, I never I caught the I, I want to uh, explore space or, or learn more about that bug. Uh, and I, I didn't have any Navy influence uh, in my life. Most of my influence was uh, Army folks. Yeah, well, the, the 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 Naval Academy beat the Navy stuff out of me. I went in the Marine Corps. So my dad was a Marine and actually my son's a Marine now as well. So it, uh, we, we went that route in our house. Yeah, the, the only connection that uh, the Marine Corps has to the Navy is, of course, it's part of the Department of the Navy. Uh, and the Navy takes you guys places. Yes. So we can do the important things. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, out of all the services, I'm a huge fan of the Marine Corps. Not, not so much the other branches beyond the army. And, and I'm being sincere when I say that I am biased. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So you go to the, uh, Naval Academy. I, I can imagine that it was a bit of, well, you went through a year before you went to the, the Academy proper, it sounds like. And so there was some sort of indoctrination that happened in that yeah. year. But there was still, I imagine, being a senior in high school and then a, a year or so later, you're now at Annapolis, Maryland at the Naval Academy. It, it had to be a different planet for you. Yes-ish. You know, it's interesting because I got to relive it all again because my son, who's 23, he graduated from the Naval Academy as well. He did a lot of very similar things that I did, except academically way different. He is, he's got the big 50 pound brain. He's got he major mechanical engineering. He aced the SATs. I mean, he's, he's, he's everything I wasn't. Um, and what's interesting is kind of reliving the entire thing and seeing the challenges he faced are very different than my challenges. I did not mind being a plebe. I did not mind the military. Uh, I was very good on relationships in hindsight, even though, my personality and my upbringing made me very self-centered in a sense of survival. 
because I had a lot of I my wife hates it. I call I call them reps. I had a lot of repetition of of look at me, 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 because I was in survival mode for so long of trying to manage myself because there was no outside assistance. I didn't understand that life is actually this dichotomy between self and others, which is a dichotomy between power and leadership. And leadership is about being about others, being of service to others. I wanted nothing in life more than to be this great inspirational leader, but I didn't know what that was. I thought it was popularity for the longest time because I was popular. But when I hit the Marine Corps and you're slapped in the face with being ranked last because, yeah, you might be popular, but you suck about making it about others. It was like this aha moment of seeing for the first time, ah, oh, there's this dichotomy that's out of balance. And so. Well, well tell yeah. the story of what the NCO said to you when you. Uh, oh, it wasn't even NCO. Time. So it was my first duty station at Cherry Point, North Carolina. And I hardcore professional. I mean, I was, I am a, <laughs> I love being a Marine and I, I got, and in my squadron, I was an air support control officer. So we're a ground part of the air wing, which means everyone in the world hates you as, as a, as a job in the Marine Corps. But what was interesting about it was you're very bottom heavy for officers, junior officers. And so we had about 14 second lieutenants mm -hmm. and the Marines are very good at, at ranking each other nonstop. And so my first uh, fitness report came out and you're always ranked against your peers in your fitness report. I was ranked dead last. And matter of fact, what was what was interesting was the major that was my evaluator. He was actually a company officer that I knew well at the Naval Academy. And I was at the Naval Academy. I struggled academically majorly. I went to four academic review boards. They tried kicking me out four times for academics. My relationships, my ability to, to communicate well kept me in there. The Marines loved me. I was a brigade drill officer. I, I formed a silent drill team. And so the, one of the Marines that was at the Naval Academy knew me well and loved me well there. And likewise, he's now my evaluating officer, talking about small world, in my first duty station in the Marine Corps. And he looks at me and he goes, you want to talk about a humbling moment? He looks at me and goes, Robin, what happened to you? You used to be so good. And now you just suck. <laughs> you know, at this point in my life, you know, I've already been to four academic review boards, failed out of my major. You know, I'm, I'm used to, I'm used to failure. The only, and, and this kind of goes back to our earlier point that we're talking about at no point at any of these junctures that I blame anyone, but myself, mm. I always owned it. You know, I love Jocko Wink and Leif Babin's work, you know, dichotomy of leadership and, um, and extreme ownership. And I always owned it. And I remember looking at the major said, all right, sir, I get it. I am doing something wrong. What is it? And he goes, oh, that's really easy. You need to be a better leader. <laughs> not, not super helpful in the moment. Greek. It's like Greek to my ears. I'm like, what? Okay. How do I do that? I thought I was. He goes, oh, that's easy too. You need to make it about everyone else but yourself. I was, I, I, what are you talking about? I thought I was. He goes, I don't know. Just figure it out. So here's, the, and this became, he's a beautiful human being. I actually am connected with him on Facebook. Now, all these, all these people in my life that were these, these great agitators that were pushing me by design or by mistake, he was one of them because he laid down that gauntlet for me when I was 23 and says, you're out of balance with your dichotomy. You're all about power, popularity, and self, and leadership's not about that. It's about being a service to others. And so he laid down that gauntlet, and he said, you need to communicate in terms of others. And so what he couldn't tell me that it made my life pursuit is how do you communicate to make it about others? How do you inspire someone to trust you? How do you forge deep relationships with everyone by making it about them? And so my four keys of communication, I've used it for spy recruiting. I've used it. And I built the muscle memory around this. I use it with, with podcast and I use it with everything because it's the most important thing in the world to do is to make someone feel valued, make them feel safe, give them psychological comfort when they're engaging with you. And, and it's incorporating these four things. Number one, seek their thoughts and opinions instead of telling them yours. Two, you talk in terms of their priorities, their needs, their wants, their challenges, their pain points in life instead of yours. Three, you validate who they are as a human being, non-judgmentally with deep curiosity. Doesn't mean you necessarily agree with them. It means you're seeking to understand them. This is called deep empathy and presence. And four, when appropriate, empower them with choices. 
Because when you, if you're doing one of those four things and everything you say, everything you write, not verbally, non-verbal, I don't care what it is. It's shifting the entire focus from you to them. Their brain is rewarding them with all the great neurotransmitters are firing, saying this human being is good for me in my life. They make me feel safe. They value me. They want to affiliate with me. I trust them. That's what he couldn't tell me. Yeah. And what you've learned over a, a lot of trial and error and, and a lot of counseling and a lot of just experience is uh, people want to feel needed. They want to feel like they're being heard. And it's not you manipulating them. No. It's you, you getting them to a place where they can uh, take care of themselves, which allows them to take care of others and be a part of a uh, powerful team. And here's how I get asked that a lot too, because my background recruiting spies, counterintelligence behavioral analysis program, running that team. And, and I used to teach elicitation and all the hooky spooky spy stuff. Manipulation can trickle in if you're not being transparent. And I am a hundred percent transparent. If someone says, Robin, are you using your skills with me now? Okay, sure. <laughs> am I, am I doing something consciously to make it about you instead of about me? Yeah. But at this point I, I don't even have to just because my reps it's, it's actually became, you can't stop being who you are. You can add things to who you are. And I've really added a lot of reps to it. And so transparency to me is huge because transparency empowers people with knowledge. You empower people with knowledge, makes them feel safe to make decisions that are in terms of them. And so that vulnerability of being completely open and honest about who I am also empowers them with knowledge and choice so they can feel safe. And also the most important thing is no ask. I literally will be of service without an agenda, without an ask. My only agenda is because everyone says, oh, every time you have an engagement, you have an agenda. Okay, my agenda is to make you feel great about being who you are as a human being. That's my agenda. No ask. There's nothing hidden. And if I do have an ask, I'll let you know exactly what that ask is. And I'll do all I can to you know, make, make it worth your while, Talk, t t tell you how I can be possibly a resource for you in terms of your p priorities and challenges and pain points. And if you say you'd rather not, okay, pretty easy. Robin, we're going to explore various parts of your life more, but I, I, I have a good understanding of your background at a high level uh, between being a, a teacher of spies, uh, being a, a G man in the FBI, and, and all that comes with that, uh, Naval Academy, Marine Corps, and then growing up. Out of all those parts of your life, what has uh, had the biggest influence on who you are today? Fatherhood. Know? Ah, uh, the, the one I missed, the obvious one. Say more about that. Best thing I've ever done in my life. It is the greatest. Uh, it, I pour everything into it because I absolutely love it more than anything. It is my son's my best friend. My daughter's the best girl in the world. There you go. I, it's my, I could, I could share every single text with my son and I, everything starts out with hi, best friend. Good night, best friend. How you doing? Best friend. My son's 23 years, 23 years old in a Marine going off to flight school. Um, yeah. Uh, he has been, you know, someone asked me the other day, cause I do a lot of executive coaching. You go, and someone asked me the other day, who's your coach? Um, my son and my wife are my coaches. Mm because they're my loving critics. They are completely open and honest with me. Uh, every time before I go on a TV appearance, I run everything I'm going to say through them for that objective opinion. Every time before I do any major life decision that we're going to do as a team, it goes through them, not because they're better, because they're objective, because we all need a great loving critic in our life to be objective for us. When we're emotionally attached to our outcomes, we tend to not make the best decisions, not saying they're be going to be good or bad or wrong, but when someone can objectively look at it through another lens for us, it makes us a little bit better. So, um, being a father hands down, he gave me a lot of reps, a lot of reps on counseling and coaching, uh, with both of them, because if you can coach mentor and guide someone half your age, inspire them to do things that are, that they want to do that they know is in their best interest and you still maintain a good, healthy relationship with them. There you go. That is the world's greatest challenge <laughs> and, and a fantastic one. Yeah. It's, it sounds like your, your wife and your son are really good friends of yours as well. And I say the word friend, I, I saw Absolutely. something, saw something the other day said, Hey, if you want me to be your buddy, we can go out and have a good time. Uh, but if you want me to be your friend, I'm going to speak objectively to you from time to time. And it's because you're my friend. I want you to be better. I want you to have a better life experience. And so, yeah, that, that is a, a certainly a powerful form of love is being objective with uh, those around you. Yeah. 
No doubt. So yeah, so being a father and literally doing what we're doing now. I it, so when you take that background, teaching, being liked, communicating, being an extrovert, driving energy from the outside world, becoming curious at a deep level, what I'm doing now is exactly what I was born to do. <laughs> There's no doubt. I love it. And today. Yeah, we're going to All right, we'll come back to that. So let's go back to the Naval Academy. Yep. You wanted to major in aerospace engineering that didn't work out. What did you end up majoring in? <laughs> Political science. I, I, I'm not going to make fun of you because I, I was a history major. They're, they're basically I should have done history because I'm a history, a huge history buff as well. Um, but someone said, you know, there's a cliche at the Naval Academy called poli sci cuper high. In other words, you know, qual, you know, your, your grade point average high. No, it wasn't still sucked, but it was enough to get me graduated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, at the end of the day for a lot of kids, uh, you, you and me included, uh, it's a binary problem. You either get the diploma or you don't. Yeah. You know, I, I wish I knew how to learn um, back then. I just didn't know how. To, it's fine, too. I, I read I, I'm an avid reader and uh, great individual, Jim Pyle. He's a one of the world's premier interrogators, interviewers. And uh, one of his books he wrote uh, not too long ago, he went through interview and interrogation in his book. And he's got a chapter on note taking. Mm. And he talks about how to take notes during an interview or a class. And I sat there dumbfounded that, huh, I didn't know how to take notes like that. <laughs> I wish I knew that in ninth grade. Oh, my gosh. I, 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 him and I are good friends. And so I had him on the podcast. And I'm like, Jim, you humbled me again, man. And he goes, I'm in my 50s and I finally learned how to take notes. I'm a complete <laughs> idiot. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Better late than never. Hey, it's a journey, not a destination. So, uh, were you gonna? What were you gonna do with political science, or was it not about political uh, graduate. science? Graduate. The graduate. Yeah, back yeah. then I was a hardcore Marine. You know, so after so my the the Navy pilot side went dead on me when my eyesight went to twenty thirty. Back then, even though it's twenty twenty now again for some reason, hmm. and back then it was uncorrectable. The grades being competitive for the uh, naval aviation was yeah, it wasn't looking good um, with my with the grades I had and. Then I spent uh, one of my summer cruises when I was on a ship and that was not a pleasant experience. And they took us in, in because in other words, I got seasick really famously. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then I'm a pilot now and I still, I got to be careful. I can make myself air sick um, flying. And so I remember during one of our summers, they take it around the, the, all the different warfare communities and they took us down to Pensacola. Now when I was in high school, one of the other things I did was I wanted to fly. And so I, I, I paid for my own flight lessons when I was in high school. And so mm. I flew, I was, I used to I, I talk about working a system. I was able to get periods free and enough blocks during a day in high school. I used to, I used to ride my motorcycle to an airport about 30 minutes away from us in Danbury, Connecticut, take flight lessons and then t ride the motorcycle back to high school for the rest of the day in football practice. Um, I only had, I only had enough money to get myself soloed. So anyway, I had all this great confidence in flying because I'd flown when I was in high school. <laughs> this guy, this pilot takes me up down there seeing this really overconfident cocky midshipman. He did a couple barrel rolls with me. I lost my lunch in that cockpit. I said, put this thing down. I never want to do this again. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Yeah, I said, this, Mar this Marine Corps thing's looking really good right now. <laughs> the, the, the thought of a barrel roll makes me uh, sick. Oh, oh, no way. Oh, and, and like in a cockpit, you're you're completely encased. I mean, that's just oh, that's awful. Yeah, it was a T thirty four mentors what they used back then. You know, high horsepower, you know, turboprop plane, um, front seat, back seat. You know, behind each other. I was in the front seat. The instructor's in the back seat. He goes, "All right, so, so I'll help you through this. Just yank back on that joystick a little bit. You know that that you know the the whatever. <laughs> Jam it over to the left and take it through a bow roll. I did one of those. I was like, whoa, no way. <laughs> he said, "Hey, let's do a few more." <laughs> oh horrible yeah, that, that yeah I, I uh i take big commercial jets that's that's all i've yeah. ever done i can do I've it ever. i don't i can't do that stuff now but i do fly a lot now my fun so my son got a pilot's license in high school we did a lot of flying together i got better at it but yeah <laughs> so uh how does the marine corps uh process work uh, so you've been selected to be a marine how do you figure out what you're going to do in the marine corps how does that process work um Luckily for my son, he, when you, you either are a 
at, at large, basically, is a good way to put it. You're a basic Marine Corps officer or you're a flight contract. My son got a flight contract. So he's he was he went into what's called the basic school right after graduation for six to seven months of basic officer training where they train you in the Marine Corps. Every Marine, a rifleman, every Marine Corps officer, a platoon commander. And so it's six months of learning how to be a platoon commander. And during that phase, unless you have a flight contract like my son and 45 others of his of his graduating class going down in Pensacola, you're in the general population and you're and you're stacked and, and racked and stacked for the entire time. And they do a thing called thirds because they want a quality spread in the Marine Corps. So you have the top third, middle third, bottom third, and the top people in each of those thirds gets their first choice, second thirds. You know, so you're you put down what you want to do in the Marine Corps for your military occupational specialty job. And then based on needs of Marine Corps, based on your ranking, you get your job assignment. I got my seventh out of 15. <laughs> Could have been worse. I, I was middle of the middle third. Uh, it's So I got what's called air support control officer. I was a 7208. No one had ever heard of it in my TBS company. I had no idea what it was. Um, my first cho- choice was tanks. Second choice was combat engineers. Uh, third choice. I don't even remember what the third choice was, but it wasn't that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's got to be a weird process, uh, having an affinity for a handful of jobs in the Marine Corps, then you get end up with something entirely different. You know, it's just part of life. You know, that's why I, I loved, you know, that, great question earlier when you asked, you know, what did you enjoy? Did you enjoy it? I loved it all. It, it was it was really fascinating. Never once, fr- I guess I got really accustomed to not getting what I wanted. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was just happy not to go to an act board and about to be thrown out. I mean, I was getting a paycheck at least. Um, <laughs> just, oh, it, it was just sideways. Yeah, I hated my job in the Marine Corps though. But what was really cool was I got to do something really cool. So I'm in my squadron for two and a half years. I did a lot of deploying to 29 Palms. And so I did, it was called the Combined Arms Exercise. We did two of those back to back. Then we went to Weapons Tactics Instructors course to support that in, in Yuma, Arizona. So I was gone three to six months out of every year. And that was CONUS. So I wasn't even being deployed uh, on the Marine Expeditionary Units of Muse. And so I wasn't earning any ribbons or any, or any creds. I was just going on deployments because there's only three squadrons in the entire Marine Corps that did my job. And so you're always on demand with all the other ground units. But the interesting thing was on my last deployment, I was able to get short tour to two and a half years at Cherry Point because I was a regular commission because a Naval Academy guy. And I was so sick of going to 29 Palms and I remember calling my monitor and there was sort of people that do the job assignments in Marine Corps and said, hey, uh, I'm out here at 29 Palms again. I'm curious, is there any way I could get short toured and start getting ready to move on to Max duty station? He goes, yeah, because you're a regular commission. I can. He goes, do you want to go to Paris Island hmm. and be a series commander? And I go, F yes. You know, because I was already at this point because my job in the Marine Corps was very limited in mobility up. So we were very bottom heavy on, on junior officers. Then there's two captains, one major and a Lieutenant Colonel is a squadron commander. And every single Lieutenant Colonel squadron commander was an aviator. Yeah. You can tell exactly where your career is going nowhere. And it's also a, what's called a critical MOS job in Marine Corps. So you couldn't lap move out of it. You were stuck. And so I was already considering, I was probably going to wind up getting out because the job just, I love being a Marine, but the job was not suited well to what I wanted. Um, but I got a chance to go to Paris Island to be first a series commander there for five cycles on a drill field. I had 16 drill instructors that worked for me, 250 recruits, did five cycles. I moved up to depot headquarters and scheduling then in operations. I was one of the ones, uh, key implementers of what's called the Crucible in the Marine Corps. Um, one of the drafters of that. So every Marine now that goes through Paris Island or, or uh, San Diego goes through the crucible. I wrote it uh, with a couple other Marines. Uh, it was, that was, that was life forming. That's when I finally got a chance to see what leadership was by throwing yourself in the line of fire for Marines figuratively career wise, at least not um, bullets down there. Although we had Marines commit suicide, both recruits, drill instructors. I mean, you name it. You faced everything in life down there at the age of 27, and it was life-forming awesome. Loved it to death. Uh, did you end up doing five years? Yep, active? did five. Yep, did five active, got out of captain, came right into the FBI from there in 1997. Oh, the FBI recruited you out of the Marine Corps? Yep. Yeah, literally, they did. <laughs> they recruited me. It was kind of, it was, it was strange and funny. 
Were you thinking FBI at any point? No, my wife was. <laughs> I got married. Um, we got married right. I, I graduated from TBS on March 30th. On April 3rd, a couple of days later, we were married. Uh, we went to high school together. We actually, we were in the same classes from middle school on. Never communicated to each other. Had this, exactly the same groups of friends. We re-met at a mutual friend's Christmas party in December of 92 in April of 93, just three months later, we were married. That's Marine. Wow. See the hill, take the hill. Yeah. And so <laughs> celebrating 30 years coming up. And so, yeah, that was, that was, that was, that was a hoot. Yeah. That's uh, you, you don't, you don't waste any time, man. I, I waited almost four years before I. Yeah. Oh, I, so, uh, so anyway, what happened was when we were in middle school together, we did a class trip down to Washington DC. And back then they still did the tours of the Hoover building and the FBI I don't remember. I kind of remember it. I remember buying um, what's called Ferrari glasses when they came out with folding glasses. We used to get the Ferrari mm -hmm. glasses to look cool. And this is a middle school trip. What does every guy care about? Just trying to look cool in front of the girls. And so my wife, though, really got into the, the FBI and, the, and doing all that kind of stuff. And so she applied to the FBI before I did. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, her application got stalled because she's competing against everyone else down in Columbia, South Carolina. We had a recruiter from the FBI come to Paris Island, says, I think Marine Corps officers make great FBI agents. There's a loophole back then in the process that you don't have to apply through the local office here because local office down in Columbia, South Carolina, which was our regional area, um, had every single military officer in the entire southeast getting out going through them. And they had a quota of only 10 people they could put in the FBI Academy. Meanwhile, this guy came from Cleveland, Ohio, and he goes, I have no Marine Corps officers applying to the FBI Academy, and I think they make great ones. And I'll get you to phase two if you come with me. I said, I'll take that route. <laughs> yeah, it seems like a no-brainer. I had no idea what I was going to do in the FBI. I just like, hey, it's a job, and I get to serve my country. It was not on my bucket list at all. Yeah, it's it's weird how life hits you that way, right? Yeah. Then I get assigned New York City, which was my fifteenth choice <laughs> again, <laughs> and I I was I lucked into going to firearms on my first firearms training up there because you do a rotation for about three to six months before you get assigned your permanent squad. And I was at firearms training. I was, I was on applicants. We we're doing applicant background investigations, learning the city long before GPS was, in, in, you know, invented. So all we had was Hagstrom maps, trying to follow, sp you know, people and spies and terrorists around the five boroughs of New York with a Hagstrom map. That's fun. Um, but I met firearms and these two guys on either side of me, really senior agents, saw my Marine Corps baseball hat I was wearing as we we're doing firearms. They go, hey, you a former Marine? I go, I am. He goes, what squad are you on? I go not on anyone yet. I haven't got a sign. They said, Oh, you should come to our squad. I said, what do you do? And they said, well, we work counterintelligence and we recruit GRU officers, Russian spies. I go, what's that? <laughs> I said, and they said, well, it's a great squad. We're all former military on a squad because we can all kind of identify with the people that we're trying to recruit. Cause they're all Russian military intelligence officers working in the United nations. I said, that sounds really dang cool. I luckily I applied to get on the squad right when someone was leaving. And I got on. Did you uh, need to speak Russian to do that nope. job? Nope. Russians Russians here have to be able to speak English. Did, did you have to uh, pretend to have an accent? Nah. Really? I learned. I, I taught my. I taught myself Cyrillic. I can read it, uh -huh, but uh, no. So Russian. All diplomats serving overseas have to have a level one or two language ability to speak the domestic language. And besides, if you're recruiting someone or trying to recruit sources. It's good to be able to speak their language, but you really need to, they really need to speak your language because you're, you need to be in your native language if you're going to be the one doing the brokering. So tell me a little bit more about what that job was. I mean, what, let me start with what was the end game? What was the objective of, of that job? Protect National Security United States and our NATO allies. And specifically, how, how would you do that? Whatever you <laughs> that, could tell me about that it. Is, that is the, that is the why. And then the what and the how are by recruiting the number one goal we had was to recruit Russian military intelligence officers, GRU officers under diplomatic cover at the United Nations. And my squad, about a squad of 10 or 11 of us on any given day, plus or minus. And we covered, I can't remember the exact numbers, anywhere between 25 and 35 GRU officers assigned to the United Nations under diplomatic cover. And, Our and job is to recruit them. Recruit them. And then did you have to manage them after they were, were recruited? 
if you could get one on board, it's like buying a lottery ticket. It's because so basically, I'm selling a service of American patriotism to a very small, limited client pool that doesn't want to buy your service. Who it's illegal for you to initiate contact with because I was FBI, they're diplomats, and so it's actually against treaties that I was going. So you cannot cold call, and also their training. If anyone initiates contact with them, you're automatically affiliated with, with the United States intelligence and they'll never have contact with you again. So you have to create a dynamic where they, they'll find you, they initiate the relationship. And then the next thing is you have to identify priorities, challenges, and pain points. Those four, one of those four things we talked about at the beginning to try to solve for them in their lives and be a resource for them overcoming um, challenges of educating their children in the West dying wish of a mother or grandmother or something in their family that their children won't grow up under Putin's oligarch regime. And then, so that's the first thing you do is one, be able to have access to communicate where you're going to solve a pain point that they may have. And then the most important part is, will they trust you with their lives and their family's lives? And that takes time. Yep. It it's, nothing, time. it's nothing you say, Hey, here's a million dollars. Why don't you cooperate? What are you nuts? Yeah, to use your uh, lottery analogy, uh, well, let me back up. How many years did you do that? 22. It's a long time. How many times did you win the lottery in those 22 years? I was part of probably, I never did an exact count, uh, five to 10 great operations. Uh, my my chief mentor and guide in my life. So if an agent has and is affiliated with at least one and I'm saying affiliated because it's a team that does these things. It's not one individual does a recruitment, but there's there's a primary handler and then there's there's a, it's a huge team that does these things because you're dealing with people's lives and you're dealing with national security. And my mentor and guide in my life. Um, so anyway, going back, it's if you're affiliated with at least one recruitment operation that goes successfully in your entire career, that is a massive career. That is a because. One intelligence officer, I don't care what's Russia, China, or anywhere else, the impact they make on national security in the United States is profound because they're telling you everything that, that the adversary is trying to do to undermine the national security of your country, economically, politically, institutionally, you name it, you're getting everything. It's, it's, and this isn't like cyber warfare where you get things out of context or anything. This is a human being telling you inside what is going on, what they're doing and how they're doing it and what is important to them. I mean, it's tremendous. And, and the impact is so profound too, that no one even knows it happens because these are the things that never make the press and never make the media. And my, and it's that rare because it's that challenging as I described to actually get someone on board and my chief mentor and guide in my life. He hit Lotto 14 times in his 21-year career. Wow. Wow. And this dude rolled with the greatest humility on the face of the planet. He modeled that way and behavior of how to make it about everyone. It's his his desk, I, I talk about this in my books, and I talk about it. He's, he's still a friend of mine now. He doesn't live too far from me down here. And his desk at work, nothing on it. He had a, he had a, he had a cup. That was a Tropicana concentrate orange juice can that was used in a dead drop and pens and pencils in it. That was it. <laughs> not a nameplate, not a I love me thing. He had run the director's award twice and a CIA director's award once for the best investigation in the entire FBI and the entire CIA. I had no idea. You know how I found that out? My kids, our kids are roughly the same age. And this one, my kids are really, really small. We were 9-11 together in New York. I mean, I hell, this is a. This is a piece of glass from the World Trade Center because I was right mm. there. Um, and so we used to drive down to the site every day. So we get really close um, for a huge period of time there because he lived just south of me in Jersey. I lived in New York on the western side of the Hudson. So we spent a lot of time together. So we came close. Our families are good friends. I remember one time we were at his house playing, having some pizza. Our kids are down in his basement playing. And they're playing floor hockey down there on a the cement floor. And I go downstairs. I ask Kevin, so Kevin, what are you doing? And he goes, Dad, we're playing floor hockey. This glass puck we found slides really good on a cement floor, much better than this metal puck. And I said, let me see that glass puck. I pick up this glass puck. It says the FBI Director's Award on. They're playing floor hockey for the Director's <laughs> Award. And I said, where'd you get this? And it had John's name on it and, and all this stuff. And his book, his name is Jesse Thorne. I just 
dived, you know, div divulged his first name anyway. Yeah. But it, it, he said it's in this dirty old shoebox in the corner. I look in a dirty old shoebox in the corner. There's more director's awards in there. I'm like, what the hell? I had no idea. Wow. Because this guy rolled with humility. He knew it wasn't about him. That is how you recruit a spy. That's how you forge great religion. That's how you solve any single problem in life. You make it about others. Yeah, and once you've successfully recruited as a team, uh, it sounds like they're all in at that point, right? It's it's either all or nothing. So yesish is a good way to put it. The it's generally about a three to everyone's different because everyone's tempo and pace is different, you know, from the individual you're working with. But it's generally about a three to eight month dance is a good way to put it, where you're feeling each other out in the sense of now. Granted, they're already providing information of value. But whether they're actually on your team yet, that's a dance because it's, what it is, is every single get together, they're assessing, is this person providing me the psychological comfort I need? Are they solving my pain points and challenges? And are, can I trust them to keep me and my family safe? So they're constantly assessing your knowledge. They're assessing your skill level. They're assessing your ability to forge relationships that are meaningful, real, and genuine. You know, so it's it's what we it's what all of us do in every moment of the day. We're assessing those around us of is this person good for me or not? But it's really much more heightened at this level because it's lives, country states. I mean, and so, but at a certain point, yeah, they're on board. Matter of fact, the everyone that I did work with uh, at that level, you forge lifelong relationships. Because literally you become, it, it's it's like being in a war zone together because you are doing high level stuff under the greatest stress you'll ever face in life. Because every day, every, 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 every little movement someone takes, it could end someone's life. How are you able to do it, do it for 22 years as a husband and a father? Like I, I, I can't imagine balancing all of that with that level of stress constantly. So New York was rough years. Because the tempo of New York was, uh, that was high paced, high tempo, especially I, you know, so I, I was in New York from 97 to 2006 ish. Um, and that was right during 9 11. And the op tempo on both the regular work side and then after 9 11 was immense. I did not see my family much. I was, I was gone a lot. I worked a lot. Um, and so you got to, you got to do the best you can. Luckily I had a wife that was a stay at home mom and very understanding family. My, my son will tell you though, um, not until he was about four years old, four or five, did he really know me? Oh. I was kind of scary to him when we, I remember when we finally moved, I got my, um, uh, was called a, uh, OP, um, office of preference transfer to Norfolk, Virginia for my next office before I went to headquarters. And when we got down there, I was excited because I was, so here's how you manage it. You have different assignments. <laughs> if I had stayed in New York, it would have, who knows? Yeah, the tempo was crazy, nuts. Great professionally, bad personally. But going down to Norfolk, it was tremendous. Well, you know, Virginia, it's it was fantastic. I remember I was so excited because my son is now registering for T-ball for the first time. He's uh, five years old, put him in a new elementary school down there. And I take him to, to school to sign him up for T-ball. And he's signing his name, putting his name down on a piece of paper. And then I said, Kevin, do you see what I'm doing? He goes, what? I said, I'm putting my name down too. I'm going to be one of your coaches. And like, his, what? his eyes lit up. And so that's that's that moment when it's like all in. This is bring balance to the force dichotomy. Yeah, and look, it, it, there's no perfect age to to be the your kid's t-ball coach, uh, but yeah, I mean, you don't you don't want to miss any of your kids' lives, but uh, you, you got to do what you got to do sometimes. Yep, ebbs and flows. Yeah, you mentioned nine eleven, and you were in New York at the time. Can can you? And I don't want to derail us too much, but can you take us through that day? Yeah, you, vividly. So our office, uh, twenty six Federal Plaza, is about five blocks from the, where the Trade Center was on Broadway. Right across from 290 Broadway, which is another office of ours. Uh, that day, if you got into the office about by around 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning, you might be able to get a spot close enough to the building because there's no parking spots in the building for your bureau car. There's only a spot for the supervisor and the primary release supervisor. So two spots for a squad, about 12 to 15 people sometimes. So you're parking out on the street trying to 
jockey for positions and not walk like 15 blocks to the office. And so that day I'd gotten in early enough. I was on Thomas street, which is right in front of the building across the street. Um, right as it comes up to the intersection of church street and church goes right straight South to the world trade center, North, all the way up to Northern Manhattan. And so I got in there early, beautiful day. I mean, everyone remembers, you know, that day that, you know, of September 11th, especially on the East coast it was it was crisp. It was dark blue skies. The wind was blowing. It was like 72 degrees. I mean, it was just perfect. I'm on the street, you know, around nine o'clock in the morning, because we generally get in early, you do some work or you go for a run on the West side highway. And then, or you get a cup of coffee down at the little coffee stand with the bagel guy on the, on the street corner. So we were regularly down there. My friend uh, Drew and I go down to get a cup of coffee and we're literally there on Broadway at the little bodega in front of the 26 federal plaza. And you could see the trade center. I'm like, I can, you know, if anyone's watching, you know, it's like me looking up to the left as I'm facing Broadway down to my left in front of me, that was Southeast. I mean, Southwest. And that's where the trade center was. All of a sudden you heard the explosion of the first plane hitting. And I remember Drew and I looked up at him. Drew was a, an army pilot during um, Black Hawk down and stuff like that. So he's a pilot. And we look up at the facade. I mean, we're talking like the second it hit. And it looked like, because the facade of the Trade Center was so big, it looked like a small plane hit it. Mm. And the first impact, I mean, the first thoughts we had was we're looking around, we're looking at clouds, fog. And then I remember him and I both said to each other, the guy must have had a heart attack and hit the side of the building. And and it looked like a small plane. And so we went up to our, our floor. So our floor in the 26th Federal Plaza is the 25th floor. So we had pretty much a, a level eyesight without obstruction of the trade center. And so we go to, you know, cause everyone's now gathered around the windows of, of our floor, which is counterintelligence floor looking out at, you know, just Southwest towards the trade center. And I remember saying to myself, we see the fire station below us responding because there was one right next to our building. And I remember just looking at the smoke. This is before it even turned into a fireball. Just looking at the smoke expanding from where the impact was. And I remember thinking to myself, that I wonder how they're going to get this thing out. It's that far up. How are they going to put this fire out? And I remember just thinking to myself, is this getting worse or getting better as you're watching this? And the next thing I remember was you started seeing debris falling from those floors in the trade center. And that's when, if you've never seen something for the first time, you don't know what you're looking at. But it took a second glance to realize I wasn't looking at debris fall and I was watching legs and arms flailing as it was jumping. So I ju- I'd counted eight people jump. And morbidly, I was actually timing it. I was trying to see, is this getting worse or getting better? And I was always, for, I was constantly trying to assess how are they going to take care of this? How are they going to fix this? And so as I saw the eighth person from my vantage point jump, that's when the fireball came through the South Tower. Mm. And that was, so I'm watching that live. I had just seen another person jump and that fireball goes flying through. And that's when it got really interesting. Because that's when, as my one of my favorite expressions that we all face in the last couple of years during COVID, there's no SOP for chaos, standard operating procedures, because the world went into chaos, all except for one organization, the NYPD. Mm. I got to tell you, those guys had their crap wired. T- tell me more about the NYPD that day. So. I, I was dumbfounded about how organized they were. Giuliani was governor, I mean, uh, mayor. Put anything politically aside for anyone, that day in that time period, this man ran that city extremely effectively. His chief of police, the whole, they locked down that city in minutes. I mean, they lit, and they locked down all the airspace, you know, the, all three airports. I mean, their ability to control that city within minutes was dumbfounding to me. When I... And they were their command center. I mean, as I worked in our command center, you know, which is a, it, it was not nearly as organized. You walked in NYTP's um, command center, and you felt like you walked into a sci-fi movie. I mean, they had they had monitors everywhere. They had the highest technology everywhere. They had all the liaisons. I mean, it was so was such a well-oiled machine of them running this operation, investigation, and and crisis management. It was just, it was like they'd done it a million times. It was just really, really well done. I was so impressed with them. And what was so striking me in that first day was, so we started our shift work right away. I had lead number two on, on the, on what was then called pent bomb. 
individual sees plane flying down Hudson River. Literally, that was my lead. I had to go talk to this individual that saw a plane flying down the Hudson River because you cover every single lead. And that's when we first started doing our shift work. I got released at around 5.30 that day to go home because I was going to report back. I was on the 6 a.m. To, to midnight shift. So we started 12 on 12 off shifts for about four or five months, seven days a week, no stop. And that didn't count commute time. That didn't, And you could only get released at the end of the day once your lead was covered. You got at least one lead a day and you couldn't go home until your lead was covered. And they generally give your lead around one minute before midnight. But anyway, you got, I got released. I remember driving home at 5.30 on 9-11. I got a shot. I actually took a shot, a picture for, uh, of the of looking west as the sun was setting as a, as, with the smoke and everything from the Trade Center uh, on Broadway. I remember driving home on the West Side Highway. I was the only car on the entire highway in all of New York City. Wow. And that was at 5.30 on 9-11. That hasn't happened since, right? Or before. It was bizarre. It was it was it was like being in one of those apocalypse movies. I was I felt like the only human being on the entire road, and then and that's when that's when life got high tempo, no doubt. Yeah, and as it should, uh, we were clearly under attack as a as a society and a culture, and uh, clearly, yeah, I we and need very, to respond and very to very unified. Our- it was very unified. I couldn't, you know, the amount of help and support we got from everyone to do our job was profound. I couldn't believe it. When the second plane hit the tower, obviously you used the word chaos. I, I that's a great word to use. Uh, when the when the t- tower one collapsed and the second tower collapsed, were you worried about your own safety with those buildings coming down? Where given yeah. where you were, yeah. Um, one of my stories was so on our floor in our building, we had about maybe about nine former Marines, and it was interesting. My optic was a lot of people ran. Some people ran to command centers or rally points that were getting passed via the radios because all our all our communications were down, uh, handheld radios they were using. And so some people did that. Some people ran home. Some people just left. I mean, I, you don't. But what the the nine or so Marines on the floor, we rallied together and we took charge of our floor. We started locking up safes because one of the things uh, from the Murrow building when uh, during the bombing there by um, uh, what's his face, the, uh, the the horrendous guy that bombed the federal building. When he bombed that building the, where the FBI was that all the files, file cabinets were unlocked and, and safes were open. And so files classified documents flying all over the place. So we had a, the team of Marines on our floor. We started securing everything. And I remember we went down to our acting boss because our boss had just gotten killed, believe it or not. And in the world trade center, uh, yeah. John O'Neill was his name and he had just retired from the FBI. So we had an acting and it was interesting. We didn't get a lot of direction. So we kind of took charge of ourselves. And I remember there was one, uh, one guy on my squad, a senior guy who was a former Marine. He's during, he's in, in the Marine Corps during te- the Tet offensive at Quezon. And I mean, talk about a war hero. <laughs> And I remember we made a pledge to stay with each other because at this point, there's a lot of rumors that were going around. We had heard that there was a, a truck bomb inbound to our building, the federal building, and that was trying to take out our building next. And so and we're staying inside, securing the building and trying to coordinate you know, responses and the whole chaos thing. And I remember Mike and I made a pledge to stay next to each other because, you know, the thought process was if the building goes down and you're alive and get trapped, it's better to be trapped and die with someone than die alone. And so, yeah, I felt for my safety. Yeah, that's um, yeah. So most people have never experienced what you just described. I, I can't imagine going through that and going through the rationalization of our, our the logic for us being together is sort of a life and death sort of calculation. Yeah, yeah. I, you want to, you know, you're cognating. All right, if I die, how do I want to die in this moment? All right, tell me about um, what you're working on these days. Ah, the good stuff. No, it's all good stuff. So, um, so the evolution of all this was forging great relationships, having great conversations and being a resource for the success of others. And that's what I wound up doing. So I started teaching at the FBI Academy back in 2008, regained that passion that my grandmother gave me all those generations ago. And teaching, mentoring, guiding, I started writing. I've written three books on forging trust, building rapport, building trust, building relationships, using the spy stories and anecdotes. And when I retired in 2018, I did it full time where I'm a speaker. 
I'm a coach, uh, executive coach, uh, keynote speak speeches. And like you, my greatest passion as part of this process of being a service is I host my podcast, which is forged, forged by trust, where I chat with people just like this. We, we go on a journey together to a destination of understanding what message and what skills can we share with each other that's going to make our lives better and richer for creating great conversations, creating great relationships, and having a healthy way to engage life. I love that. Uh, all right. So I, I have a prepared question for you. That's my only prepared question. Well, actually, I have, I have two. The first one is, out, out of being an author or a uh, professional speaker, trainer, facilitator, or coach, which is your favorite? Oh, there's elements of all I really love. I'd say it's it's a the most it's a boy it's a tough one to balance. My two favorite I'm gonna have to give you two because I love them equally. Uh, I love doing the podcast, and I love being a coach, and I love them both for the same reason. I love when you can see someone's lights go on when they have an aha moment where you're part of them doing a little bit better today and tomorrow because of sharing a little bit of knowledge or help more importantly, helping them discover something that was within them already. And, and though that's both those things do just that. Yeah. I have, I have a feeling you're more intentional about it than I am, but uh, I, I encounter that from time to time. And when it happens, it's magical for me. I, I love it when that happens. It's you'd like to be intentional, but you really can't. You just got to be present, aware and hope that at the end of the day, you ask that right question that's going to resonate with someone. All right, you've written three books. I can't imagine even starting to write a book. Uh, what's the process like, and, and did you enjoy it? I enjoyed each of mine. Um, they were different. The first one I self-published, it's called It's Not All About Me. It's my manual on, on, on how not to be the narcissist I was born to be, I say. <laughs> it's a short read. It's 20,000 words, 25,000 words. My Audible that I, I recorded myself for it, it's, it's only about two and a half hours long. Uh, I put a podcast at the end of it with my good friend Jack Schaefer, who's a licitation master. And that was a, a work of com compulsion is the best way to put it. I was compelled to do that. I, I took me about nine months to, to put those 25,000 words together. It's not the best written. It's very granular because it's completely 100% me without editing. Um, but it's done really, really well over the years. I came out with that in 2011. I think it was 10 or 11. And I'm at 125,000 copies I've sold as a self-published book. That's pretty dang good. <laughs> That's amazing. That's it amazing. Is. I love that book. Um my my next book was a code of trust. I did that with St. Martin's Press. Matter of fact, I had the same editor as Jocko with Lincoln, Leif Babin. Extreme Ownership came out right behind, right, right ahead of mine. The publisher thought it was going to do as well. Nope, it did it did good. All my books are bestsellers, um, but um, that was good. So I worked with a writer on my next two books, Code of Trust and Sizing People Up, and and collaborating with a writer. It's another great process. Um, enjoyable where you get to do a, most of the talking, recording, editing together. I mean, it was really a good process, different than the first ones because someone's helping you organize it, uh, which was good. It's ha working with a professional writer was a profound education because this Cam Stout, who was my writer with me, uh, he r had written 25 books by, by that time. And that's, that's a big deal. Uh, so he's a very good writer. So working with someone like that is really good. And I got another one in me that we're tinkering with. So I'll probably self-publish. We'll see. As you say, are you going to do it on your own or not? It sounds like you're ready to do it on your own again. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go where the universe dictates I go. I always have to. So I have an, I have a, a literary agent. It always has to go through and uh, Penguin who published uh, uh, Sizing People up my last one, Penguin Portfolio. Um, the, they have first right of refusal of anything to put out next, but they'll probably, cause again, I had bestsellers, but not blockbusters. So we'll see, but I'll, 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 it'll publish it. I'll publish it no matter what. First right of refusal for the next one, but not every single next book that you write. No, I think it's just the next one. Yeah. But who that, knows? That, how would, many... that would be spirit crushing. If it was every book you ever write from here from here on. Yeah. Cause that's a, so I put my first book out self-published in about nine months. When you work with a publisher, that's about a three year process. Oof. You don't you even, remember. Been, by the time it comes out, you don't even remember what you wrote. <laughs> yeah, I say, we, we haven't talked about patience, but you obviously have a fair amount of patience. 
That's and then going through the FBI's pre-publication review process to get it approved to get released. That's another work of patience and trust. And you, you're subject to that the rest of your life. If it's bureau related, yes, ish is a good way to put it. Um, okay. But the next one, so I'm pretty much tinkering with um, mastering success behaviors, uh, things like that for next one. I'm probably going to shy away from direct anecdotes about the FBI as much as I can. So I don't have to go through that process because they love saying no. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy, right? Yeah. They, it's a, they got a big bucket of it. <laughs> An endless supply of those. Oh, it's a, it's a labor. <laughs> oh man. All right. Here's my second prepared question. You uh, get to uh, be a, a talk show host one time only. It lasts for roughly an hour, hour and a half. You get to have a few guests on of your choosing. Uh, those guests can be about entertainment. They can be uh, thought provoking. They can be fun. They can be serious. Uh, they can be alive or dead, your guest. Uh, your four guests, one male, that's it. One female, a musical act. And then if you're into stand-up comedy, a stand-up comedian. All right. So you're going to have to remind each one as we go. So we'll start with one male, dead or alive. Was There's a lot on there. I'm probably going to, at this point in time, I'd probably go with Marcus Aurelius. Oh, he was uh, several centuries ahead of his time. Yeah. Um, so he was one of the great Stoics and one of my passions is uh, Stoicism. Um, love it to death. It's a great thought process for solving challenges and problems. I do a lot of reading on the Dalai Lama. I love Buddhism. I read the Tao Te Ching every day. Um, so all these, all those mindfulness kind of books, uh, Eckhart Tolle's, uh, the new earth and, um, the power of now, all these books are very good to understand self. Because once you understand and communicate with self, you can be, be more effective at communicating with others. So I'll do the first one as Marcus Aurelius because he did a really good job of that. Here's the emperor of Rome acting with great humility to keep himself grounded. So they don't get better than that. Yeah, he didn't have to. He, he had every reason not to, to uh, yes. contain himself. Yeah. Yes. All right. So what's the next one? Female. Female. Boy, that's another good one. You know. I'm probably going to go Mother Teresa. Can't go read, wrong with Mother Teresa. I read a I read a couple of her books, and what was striking about her was her complete embrace of poverty to serve, and seemingly very rarely, if ever, got sick as well. It's it's interesting when you are surrounding yourself with the most disenfranchised of humanity that are diseased with everything that is communicable. And yet she was able to do so with a smile on her face and be of such humble service to others to the very end. That's someone very unique. Yeah. Her level of humble service became internationally known, right? Yeah. And that and has nothing, and this has nothing to do with religion or anything else. It's just all about humble service. And so here's someone who never tried for fame, glory, or name recognition. And yet look at the impact she had. She's like uh, your your buddy, your mentor, who uh, had his director's board as a hockey puck. Yeah. <laughs> so, similar personalities, I imagine. Yeah, no doubt. All right, next, uh, musical act. This is your talk, talk show, but you'll have a musical act to uh, break up the uh, Q&A part. Boy, who do I go with on musical acts? This is meant to be a little more revealing than everything we've talked about thus far. I got a, I'm, I'm an eclectic listener of music. Like right now I have classical on in the background. Um, but I love my, my music from my childhood and growing up. Um, and one of my favorites, cause I used to love to play it as well as listen to it. And it's going to sound, it's going to be really corny, but I love Miami sound machine and Gloria Stefan. They've made great music. Yeah. <laughs> The musician. She's, won bunch, she's won a bunch of awards and, and they did it really well for a long time. Yeah. I, I, I love the music they put out. Great big band sounds with pop. That's good. No, I mean, it's wildly popular. She became very, very uh, rich off, yep. off, off, off of her music talent. Yeah. So that, that's a throwback for me. Very cool. Are you into stand up comedy at all? Yes. Ish. 
<laughs> All right, since you're ish, you can you can give me uh you can give me a stand up comedian. Can be I mean every time I think about stand up comedy, I think about my childhood and guys like I, so so the two people that pop in my head, I I I'll get canceled if I mention their names. So I can't. <laughs> I think all, that's true for most comedians, right? Yeah. So I I love these two guys. They're, so all it says they're both on Netflix. And okay. I, I, I love their true speak. Um, as inappropriate as it can be sometimes, generationally, it's uh, it's it's fun. Uh, but I also, so I'll, it, I think it's a, a good safe bet um, that also is equally a, a love and passion of mine. And a lot of people, I love Jerry Seinfeld. His, his stuff is really good. Really good, not controversial, right? Like, uh, available to everyone, sort of oh, thing. Oh, actually, you know what? Here's here's I'll here's another throwback one. I absolutely love to death, and he's he's so multi dimensional. I love Steve Martin. Oh, I, I I want Steve Martin to be in my house whenever I come through my yeah. Door. He, he's he's my someone TV? I'd love. To, so he's someone I would love to interview too. Just be part of you know because from him doing King Tut on on Saturday Night Live when I was growing up, all the way to the roles he's played in movies. I mean, during the holidays, who? I mean, just planes, trains, and automobiles. You know, all these things he's played are these great deep characters that make you feel. At the same time, he's one of the funniest human beings. And some of his characters not so deep, like uh, Wild and Crazy Guys with Ackroyd on SNL. <laughs> I know. It's or, good stuff. Uh, the Jerk is one of my favorite movies. <laughs> so, yeah. So, Steve Martin's a good one. And, and he's a safe answer as well. When we stop recording, I'm going to guess the uh, two you would have said. Sure. <laughs> All right. Let, last uh, topic. T- tell me a bit more about your family. Yeah. Um, I mentioned I've been married for 30 years to my wife, and we're – we're still best friends. My, I have two grown kids. My son's 23 year old Marine Corps officer, and he's my best friend. And my daughter is a 25 year old nurse. She's a labor and delivery nurse in Northern Virginia. And she is a rock star as well. So I'm very fortunate that I have a family full of people of service. And your daughter lives near you. It sounds like. Yep. She lives in uh fall uh, in uh, Fair Oaks, Virginia. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's uh Northern Virginia proper. I think, right? Oh yeah, that's really Northern Virginia. So she works at a Nova Fair Oaks hospital. Awesome. Well, hey, Robin, I'm so glad that Pete connected us, man. Uh, you are awesome. You've done some amazing things in your life, uh, entirely out of service to others, and you come from very humble beginnings. So it was great to uh, hear more about your story. I, I really do appreciate that. Likewise. Sorry, sorry, as I call it, it was Death by Robin, where I monologued at you way too much. But oh, you're, good. <laughs> you're all good. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd also really appreciate if you'd rate and review us. You can find us at scodopodcast.com.